Mike, if you'll put up, there's, it's in the Song Show Plus, there's a verse. I think it's at the bottom of the song sheet list, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, there you go. And we're going to jump into that today as we've been talking. But um, as it says here, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept complete until our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross, um, the cross changed everything. We lost everything with the first Adam, Adam and Eve. Sin brought in a, a disconnect in our spirit. We couldn't hear the Holy Spirit. That we couldn't hear God very well anymore unless He just showed up. It it started degrading our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions. And it also brought in death. Sin produced death. Healing or sickness, the opposite of healing, sickness is slow death. It's death coming into your body in certain ways, in colds. or uh, It's not permanent death, but it is death to organs or different things. And so the first Adam lost it, but the second Adam, I know I'm talking about big theological issues, but it said Jesus was the second Adam. Why? Because he was the second man in the human race. He came as a man. Philippians 2 said he humbled himself, took on the form of a servant because he was God, took on the very thing he created. Think about that. That's amazing. That shows how much he loved you. He created man. John, 1 John 1, 1 says he, um, John 1, 1 says he created man, and then he became the very thing he created. Think about that. What is the greatest thing you've ever created? A painting, software program, landscape, whatever. Book, writing. It's cool. It's an expression of God through you. It's creativity. Can you imagine actually becoming that thing? Of course, his greatest creation was us, and then he became us. So he was the second Adam because the first Adam was created without sin. Every person since then was born into sin, the Bible tells us. Sin is passed down through the Father. That's why Jesus uh, had a virgin mother because he couldn't have the Father's seed because sin was passed down through the Father because the Father was the one or the man was the one that brought in sin. Their eyes were not open to, to sin till Adam ate of the fruit. And I know we're getting deep into theology, but it's good to know that. So Jesus was born. He was the second Adam. Why? He was the second man born without sin. This time he didn't mess it up. He lived his whole life perfectly and never sinned. And as a result, because he didn't deserve uh he took on the punishment of sin. He, he died, took, took all of us. Uh, he died, suffered. Uh, the God's wrath was turned on him. Demons were turned on him. And he was in the ground for three days and came back up. And he said, I have conquered and overcome what sin brought into the earth. And so that restores a connection with the Father. We believe when you get saved, you can start hearing the Father. Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. He can start restoring your soul. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Your mind, will, and emotions. Amen. We don't have to live with debilitating uh, emotions of depression, discouragement, and offense. Last week we talked about, well, the week before that, we talked about being offended at God. Today we're going to talk about another sin called Another thing that affects us is unforgiveness. But he also gave us the ability to reverse death, not just in our spirit, in our soul and body. Now, we've got a long ways to go. We know it up here, but I'm looking forward to myself personally and a people who appropriate all that he did on the cross 2,000 years ago and live in health. Can can y'all book? Can we even imagine that? How many of us can imagine that? Are y'all, are y'all alive today? This means yes. At least you're alive enough to move your head. I won't ask you to raise your arms. That's too much energy, too much effectiveness. Just as long as you don't die on me in here and we have to call the mourner or something. If you fall asleep, make sure you snore so we know you're alive. <laughs> you're a quiet bunch today. And so he's wanting to do that. And we're on a journey, not just for spirit, our spirit, 
salvation, but reversal of everything that sin has done. And it's going to take a journey, but we're going to get there. And one of these things I know that he's emphasizing at this time, there's nine gifts, but one of them is uh, healing. And we're, we're going to just go after this thing. And um, it's good stuff. Y'all say amen. Make sure, you know, turn the person on your left and say it's time to wake up. <laughs> All right. I want to talk about a biggie today on the soul. And I know nobody has this in their heart today. So this is preventive maintenance. So this is what we're going to go after. Now, may the, you can just leave that up there, that one verse. I used to have more organized slides and PowerPoints, and it never worked. Because I would get the first slide, and I decided I want to skip the second slide and go to the third side, slide. And I spent more time trying to get the slides in order, and they would get me all messed up. But there's our theme verse. Now may the God of peace make you holy, complete in every way. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Many times we put off the blessings of the cross and saying it's all going to happen when we go to heaven or when He comes back in the millennium. But this says be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Well, why don't we see these things? One reason is we don't teach on these things. Until you teach on it, you're not going to see it, and until you see it, you're not going to experience it. And so many times I know my theology is based off what I experience instead of what the Word of God says. Now, even when I know what the Word of God says, I don't often experience it, but I'm going to keep prophesying it over myself and believing it and asking God why until it happens. For instance, this this is consistent. It's not just with healing. The Bible says that God prays that everyone should, should know Him and not perish. But does everyone know Him? They don't. But we still keep spreading the Word, talking about it, with the belief that everyone can if they want. And you just keep preaching it. But today, I want to talk about one of these things for our soul that is just, um, like I said, nobody in here has this problem. Be preventative maintenance. You can, you can remember this and share it with those who do. And that is unforgiveness. So let's talk about it for a little while because this thing creeps in so fast. If you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews 12, verse 14. Hebrews 12, 14. Turn it into your Bible or turn it into, you know, call up your uh, 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 Bible study app, whatever that is. I remember when I first started having everything on my Bible, it almost felt blasphemous. Maybe not blasphemous. That means you're saying God. It almost felt sinful to not open a physical Bible. I remember as a good uh, Baptist boy, and Baptists are great about this. This is not a negative. Uh, I used to have sword drills. Were you all ever in churches that had sword drills? Me and Lois, that's it. That's, I think we're a good thing. We'd all line up. I was maybe fifth grade, sixth grade. We'd have our Bibles, and they'd call out a verse, Jeremiah 2.14. And then blah, 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 all these little kids are trying to find Jeremiah. And then whoever found it first, they got, a, they got a gold star. I was so competitive. I wanted to win. I'm not sure how spiritual it was to beat everybody else out to uh, get the prize finding the Bible verse. But I sure felt good for myself. I'm not sure how much spiritual it did. But it did help me to remember the book of the Bible. You know, it's not quite the same with your iPhone or iPad trying to do a sword drill. It just doesn't quite work the same, does it? Um, but Hebrews 12, 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Verse 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no, catch this, no bitter root grows up to cause trouble. There you go. You got it up there. 
and defile many. Now look at this. That no bitter root grows up. Unforgiveness is one of these things that creep in. Last week we, or two weeks ago, we talked about being offended at God because things happen that we didn't understand and it just sort of creeps in. If you weren't here, that is a great lesson. Not necessarily that you know that you need to go and, and look that up. But it can also come in when other people do stuff to us. And they say stuff to us. Sometimes unfairly. I mean, I had one... I won't go into much detail, but I had a person this week. We'll put it this way. They're actually not in this church. I minister probably more outside this church than I do. Come up to me and they said, something you said last week, it just bothered me. And you're wrong. And I spent an hour, well, 45 minutes walking through with them. Because something I said outside of here, they took it out of context. They heard what they heard. I'm glad they came to me. And... um And we dealt with it, and at the end of it, everything was good. High-fived or fist-bumped or whatever, everything was great. But you know, later, I thought, well, how dare they say this? And I had to catch myself before a bitter root comes up and starts growing. See, this thing of unforgiveness is... I wrote down five stages that this thing can sneak in. And right now, the devil is working overtime to produce division in our nation, to produce division in your family, to produce division among one another. And this division almost always is words that get twisted or misunderstood or they accuse you of something. Maybe you actually did something, but they don't even give you the opportunity to apologize and ask for forgiveness. Or it might have just been taken out of context because it all happens. But I've noticed this taken out of context is higher than it is normally. It seems like I'm making this up, but it's almost like there's a little devil in the air. I don't think so. But there's something going on in the air when you say something. They almost don't even hear what you're saying. They hear something else. Have you ever noticed that? You see that on political realms. You see that on national realms. You see that in family. It's like it's working overtime. And so we have to work overtime to do the opposite to make sure that our hearts stay right and go back and clarify when necessary. Because the first stage is it goes something like this. Some event happens. And they misunderstood or you misunderstood. And so this event happens, first stage. Second stage Something comes in your heart. Like in my case, this, you know, uh, I was speaking. They, they heard it. They came later, which was good. They did the right thing. Matthew 18, 18 says, if there's any conflict between you or if you think there's sin, you go one-on-one with them. And if that doesn't work, then you take somebody else with you. And there's a process there. You can go look it up in Matthew 18. But it started coming in my heart. Well, my goodness, how dare they even accuse me? I mean, they accused me of being blasphemous, which was not even correct because blasphemous saying you're like God. But whatever, they misimplied it. But it's still a good big call. And they um, so it enters your heart. And then the third, so it's starting to grow if you don't deal with it. you got to catch these things. Or something your spouse says or your kids say or your employer says. It'll come in and you'll want to get defensive. You'll want to get offended. And if we're not careful, it grows into what this verse, where the verse is gone. It grows into this verse of becoming a bitter root. See, it comes in as a seed. And you have got to grab this seed before it starts growing. In Corinthians, it says, capture every thought so that no vain imaginations come up. What's vain imaginations? I can't believe they said that. And then we start building this whole scenario of what they were thinking. And it probably might have been that, but a lot of times it's never that big. And if we're not careful, it'll grow into a bitter root. And then once it becomes a root, let me say this. If you get a little weed in your yard, it's easy to pull it out, right? If you got a tree sapling that's about two feet high, you can't pull that thing out of the ground you got to go get a shovel. How many of you have ever had a bitter root in your life that it took a counselor to get a shovel to get it out? 
Nobody. That's good. One person's honest up here. <laughs> and so, we don't want it to get that far. Well, how, how, um, it says in that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. What happens when it starts setting up and you don't deal with it? It not only defiles you, it starts defiling other people around you. The fourth stage is defiled. Defiled is a fancy word. I probably should have done another another version. That means you're bleeding over your bad attitude onto other people's bad attitudes, and they get a bad attitude. And then finally, bitterness is the fifth stage. You just become bitter. Have you ever seen uh, old people? Old people tend to go two directions when they grow old. They're a fun people to be around. They're enjoyable people to be around. Everybody wants to go see grandma and grandpa. Or it's like, do we have to go? Am I the only one? <laughs> it, it really is. Well, what happened was, you reap at the end of your life what you've sowed in your life. If you've kept bitter roots out, you become a joy to be around, and your joy runs off on other people. If not, your bitterness grows stronger at the end of your life, and you no longer have the self-control because you've been doing it for decades. You just don't hide it anymore and nobody wants to be around you. I've been around older people like that. It's like, God, do I have to go? Do I need to go? Yeah, you need to go. You need to go do this. You need to go hang out with them. And you just endure their long past being talked to because the root's so, so deep. And so none of us in here, we want to be joys. And so what you do is you got, when that seed is planted, you got to yank that bad boy out of there. Well, what's some signs of bitterness? I wrote these down. You replay, so if any of these apply to you, we're going to repent today because we want our soul whole. You replay a conversation or experience over and over in your mind. Y'all thinking? So if that's you, that doesn't mean you, you forget about it. But if it's over and over again, you go, Father, I need help in this area. This seed is starting to wrap around my soul. I cut this off. And we'll talk in a minute more about how to deal with this. But we want to deal with this thing so it doesn't become a root and wrap around us. You have imaginary conversations in your mind with this person. We've all done this, haven't we? Man, I wish I had thought of this. Man, I should. I wish I hadn't bit my tongue. I should have said my mind. This is what I'm going to text. This is what I'm going to write. No, nobody writes anymore. So this is what I'm going to text. Maybe an email, you know. You then start talking about this person in a slanderous way to other people. Can you believe they did this? I know none of you have ever done that to anybody. And every time you hear this person's name, you get angry. And it starts replaying again. What does this mean? I'm telling you, the seed's in there, and we got to cut this bad boy off because we don't want to be the bitter grandpa or be the bitter grandma down the road. But you know, I have met 40-year-olds. My gosh, I don't want to be around them. Because if you mention a subject or a name, they go off. Have you all ever had a relative like that? And when, and when you have family events, you go, is there any way we can get out of not asking them to come? Maybe we'll send a text and we just accidentally leave their name off. And then when they say, oh, you weren't in that text? And then you have to ask God for forgiveness for being lying there. Does anybody else think about it this way or is it just me? Y'all are all perfect angels out here, aren't you? Y'all are quiet today. Maybe you've left my name off on some of these text lists. <laughs> oh, man. God's speaking to them. You don't, you're not yourself around that person. 
complaining. Complaining is living in a state where you think circumstances have gypped you and you deserve something better instead of learning how to let God's peace and God's joy live through you in um, a good way. So we don't want to um, stay there. So how do we get out of this thing? Are you all good? It's Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. I'll give you a chance to turn over there. Ephesians 4, 31. All right, it's, it's going to get tough here, but it's okay. We're going to get free. He's ready to leave. Just Do we need to get duct tape and, and, and put you to that chair? Where's the usher with duct tape? we got a big gray rope, big gray, big gray tape back here. <laughs> He's going to get free today. Or maybe you're having bitter thoughts towards her, and that's what you need to do. Did y'all fight before y'all came on the way over here? <laughs> y'all know I'm kidding. Ephesians 4.31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. They all go together. Brawling and slander, along with every other form of malice. Verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. All right, here you go. Forgiving each other, just in Christ gave, just as Christ and God forgave you. All right, we're going to go through five quick steps in like fifteen minutes, uh, three minutes a step. It's it's easy concept. It's just a matter of doing it. The first thing is to repent. Unforgiveness is a sin, even if you were done wrong. Unforgiveness, so repent. Unforgiveness is a sin even if you were done wrong. Listen. Oh, Craig, that's awful hard. Look what happened to Jesus Christ. He died for your sins in this room. Even though you weren't alive at that time, He died for them in advance. He has every right to be mad at Craig Cooper. Because the sins I've done, He suffered pain and abandonment from God because of what I did in 2020. I've only sinned once, but that was enough. That was some pain. <laughs> All right, that's how stuff gets taken out of context. I'm paranoid this week after this week. Well, Craig, you only said you sinned once. Humor, man, humor. Um, so that one time I sinned today, not counting the time I sinned yesterday and the day before, That caused him pain, suffering, abandonment from God. He has every right to be mad at me. But he wasn't. He forgave me. And so, the second step is to forgive. So we, so I need to repent and say, Father, I am sorry for walking in unforgiveness because you forgave me for such more than I did. And it says right here, get rid of all bit, Bitterness, in verse 31, and every form of malice. It's a sin. So when we're unforgiving, we got to go, Father, I repent. As you just, because it says, just as Christ God forgave you, we need to forgive others. Let me read to you Matthew 6, 14 and 15. I'll give Mike a couple minutes, a couple seconds, not minutes, to put that up. Matthew 6, 14. These are good biblical principles to remember. I'll go ahead and start reading it. Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive men when they sin against you... See, people's going to sin against you. And when it happened to me this past week, I did good at the moment, but then later I go, how dare they? There you go. It comes back up. How many of we go, how dare they? Don't they know who I am? Didn't they know my heart? Well, obviously not. When they sin against you, see, they sinned against me, but your heavenly Father will also forgive you if you forgive men. Verse 15. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father, look at this, will not forgive your sins. Now, I don't think you can lose your salvation. Your salvation is based off the cross and what you did. But there's somewhere in the sins that accumulated during the week or the month, or whatever. I mean, I don't know what you do with this. It says, but if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I can tell you this, you won't walk in His blessings. 
That ought to scare us to death, shouldn't it? So as soon as that little seed comes in, we've got to grab a hold of this thing at the first stage of the event and say this is not going past the seed state. This seed is not even going to get to stay there. I forgive them. So the second first step is repent if we have been in unforgiveness. So I won't say your name because it's on um, on the tape. But you need to repent of whatever she's saying you need to do. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. I can pick on him. So you just get down on your knees and repent. Secondly, <laughs> we'll use him as an example. But the second stage is you've got to forgive those who have hurt and sinned, forgive you, that have, that have sinned against you consciously or unconsciously. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people come to me and go, Craig, you hurt me here. I don't even remember the event. That doesn't mean I didn't do it. doesn't mean it was wrong. But sometimes it's just unconscious in how we speak and act and behave. But we need to forgive those who have hurt us. Otherwise, it will hinder your walk. And in many ways, if that other person unconsciously did something and they didn't even know they did it, it's they're going on with life. Meanwhile, that seed's growing in you. You think they're the ones that are getting the wrath of God. They're the ones that God's turning away. But it's setting up in you, and you're going to be worse off if you don't deal with it. This is basic Christianity 101. But it's so common. Assume responsibility for your attitude. And go, the, the power of the cross and the power of Jesus, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, there's nine of them, Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control, kindness, is greater than this offense in me. So if you need love, if you need patience, you need self-control, call out to the Father and say, and then the third step is release all obligations that you want from them. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, they did this to me. I feel I am owed an apology. They did it in public. I want them to apologize in public. You can't ask that. I mean, you can ask it. Maybe they will. Probably not. You need to release them as the third step from all obligations. You need to lay down the right to be right. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, they did this to me, and I need them to apologize in perfect. I need to hear it from them. You're going to have to release it. You may never get that. If you've had abuse in your life, physical abuse, uh, this week I counseled somebody in spiritual abuse. That means, a, a it was in this case, a pastor, a whole leadership team from another church. They came from another church. It wasn't, they, they don't go to this church. For 30 minutes, I was just praying over her because releasing this person from performance. And they were never perfect. And they can never, and I'm, that person just cried for 30 minutes. It was just prayed over her and ministered to her for things that I wasn't there, but at least in her own mind, it was wrong. And it probably was wrong. There's no way they can go back and, and they have to release any desire or need to be right. Amen? You just got to do that because if you're putting that, that's a condition to be free and forgiven. And you can be free and forgiven because the power of the cross is that strong. The fourth thing is release the person. So you're releasing any obligations and release the person. What does that mean? You say, Father, they're in your hands. I give them to you. Whether they see it or don't see it, whether they're convicted or not convicted, that's in your hands. They're your son or daughter, or if they're not saved, you deal with it however. We're not going to try to control them, expect them, extract anything out of them. Was that, does that mean that what they did was right? No. Does that mean that we forget what they did? No, you will forget, but this is how you start releasing the pain. You repent. You, 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 uh, you, you forgive them. You literally go, Father, I forgive this person. You've got to do that. Well, I don't feel like it. It's not. Feelings come later. You start with facts. One part of releasing the person is saying, 
Father, I forgive them for what they did, conscious, unconsciously. I release them to you. I don't want any more hooks in my life. You've got to go there. And it can be painful, especially if you're in long-term relationships. This is especially difficult between parents and kids, kids and parents, and, and your spouse. I'm not saying it's easy. It can be hard as concrete, pulling out a, a pole out of concrete that's been set in there. And it, it, But you just physically, if you need somebody else to help you with it, that helps a lot of times. Find a mature Christian to walk, it, walk through it with you. There's mature people to help walk it through with you. If you've been through divorce or abuse or just hateful words, is to literally go, Father, I release them, and in Jesus' name, I forgive them so that my sins are forgiven. Their sins are between them and you, and I forgive them. Otherwise, that hook is in you, and it will always stay there, and in those areas, you will never experience freedom. Because every time you think about that person, every time you think about that circumstance, the pain comes back. You will never probably, you don't forget the event, but the pain over time can go away. But it starts, just say it by mouth. Even if you don't feel nothing, maybe you feel hatred. You go, Father, I want want to hate them. I want to attack them. But by faith, not feelings, I say, Father, I forgive them. And then as time goes along, you may have to say that three times that day or 30 times or 300. When the pain comes, Father, I release them and I forgive them. They're in your hands. It's as simple as that and it's as hard as that. And you're saying, Father, as I put you on the cross, see, when he was on the cross, because the God side of you, there's seven billion people on the earth, which is more than there has been since the cross. So let's say there's been seven billion people between now and the cross, and then however many, they say, estimated less than a billion people before the cross. So seven plus seven plus one is how many for the higher mathematics people. I think that's 15. I need to get a calculator out and add it up. But somewhere around 15 billion people, not counting how many is in the future, he went through somehow or another by God and his spirit and pictured every one of you and said, I forgive you by my, what I'm doing on the cross. And if you accept the, the blood and the sacrifice that's here, I release you from your sins. And so as hard as it is for us, we have to keep that in our mind and go, Father, as you forgave us and released us on the cross, give me the power, the insight. I forgive them and I release them to you. That's not saying that you approve. That's not saying it doesn't still hurt. That doesn't, that's not saying what they did was wrong, but that's not your call anymore. You're releasing them. Many times when I've seen that happen, when you release them and forgive them, all of a sudden that person, it doesn't always happen, but many times that person gets right with God and sees what they're doing. I don't know how it happens, but somehow or another in the spirit, by us not forgiving them, it keeps them in deception and lack of clarity. But when we forgive them, more conviction comes on them because somehow or another it gives permission to Holy Spirit that is fully in their hands. Y'all got that? Because I can't repeat it again. It is a powerful act. As Jesus forgave you in advance 2,000 uh, years ago, you're releasing them to the Father. You're not approving them. But you're getting a hook out of you and not letting it grow into a bitter root. I can't tell you how many people I've met. I'm 60 now, and you meet a lot of people. When you meet them, they seem real nice, but the first time you start to get to know them, they talk about the event, the first step. And this isn't a good event. You all know what I'm talking about? something happened, and you start going, wow, what happened? You think it was like last week. It was 15 years ago. And you hear the event. Sometimes they're a big deal. A lot of times, literally, I hear about this event, and I go, I don't say this out loud, because I don't want to be another event in their life. But I I, I go, was that all? (laughs) Now, obviously, it was hurtful to them, and I wasn't there, but you go, that was all. But that's haunted them for 15 years. And what we want to see is we don't ignore the event. Obviously, it hurt. But, you know, many times this thing will grow, and the memory of it 
is bigger and more hurtful than what actually happened 15 years ago because it becomes a, a, a movie in our heads. And so I don't want to see you, me, every day I have to guard against this. Like I said this week, this came up, I said, okay, Father, I'm actually preaching on this on Sunday. I am not going to let this seed come in. There's these, there's these seeds all of the time that come up. Learn what you can, and then just release and forgive and go on where, where it's not you and you can't. But when that releasing and forgiving, do it quickly, because when it becomes a root, it's a big deal. When you're counseling somebody that something happened 15 years ago, they can get free, but it's a lot harder than if they just grabbed that thought and captive as soon as it happened. So keep quick accounts. How do you do this? You just you don't stuff it. Stuff it doesn't work. Stuff it means it's going to come back up at the wrong time. Stuffing it, I don't ever see these anymore. Pressure cookers. Any of you older people, have you ever seen pressure cookers? Do we even have a pressure cooker at our house? Have we ever used it in the last 10 years? I haven't. That is the truth. I don't even cook at all. I microwave at best. How do you rip open this package? How many times do I uh, put a number into the microwave? But for those of you, does any of you don't know what a pressure cooker is? This is this pot that you screw this top on and you turn up the, the, it's got to have liquid in it, water, I guess. And you, you turn it on, and it starts, instead of the steam escaping, it, it creates this pressure in here. And if you open it in the middle of that, you're going to get burned. It's bad news, okay? It's just all this hot air come out. But that's what happens for many people. They're pressure cookers. That's what happens when you stuff the event. Oh, I'm all right. And you know talking to them, they ain't all right. And you hope you don't unscrew that thing at the wrong time, because... You weren't part of the event, but you're going to be a part of the overflow. That's when the root came in, and and you're going to get defiled like they're defiled. But in Jesus' name, we are not going to let that pressure cooker grow up. We're not going to let the devil come into that thing. We're going to take these thoughts captive quick and deal with them. The only way you can deal with them is go to the Father and say, Father, I'm hurt. This hurt. I give you this pain. I forgive them even though I feel like choking them. In, the, in Jesus' name, I forgive them. You're going to help my feelings get right. And then it, during the day, as you feel like choking them again, say, Father, I release them and I forgive them. I thank you. I walk by faith and facts and not feelings. And you keep moving on. Amen? Let's stand. I'm going to pray over you guys. So, none of you, I'm sure, except for the guy right here, has this. <laughs> I'm just teaching you a new is is um has this problem but it will happen it'll come up because the devil he, he's trying to get that root in us no roots in this place only beautiful trees no ugly gnarled lifeless tree deals in us well craig that was awful, awful practical today but the, but it, it'll be good it's, it's good practice so remember baptism of the holy spirit Pray in tongues. That's a great way to deal with the roots. We're going after healing, and we're not allowing any nasty roots to grow in us because eventually they get so big, everybody else sees us, and they run. I'm not overemphasizing that. Have you ever seen somebody? I mean, I've seen it in teenagers. I've seen it in old people. I've seen it in the middles. When they come in the room, they go, I sure hope they don't come and sit by me. (laughs) You all know what I'm talking about, right? Y'all teenagers laughing. Do y'all know any teenagers like that? Yes. <laughs> and then they sit by you and you go, Holy Spirit, I need love right now. And help me keep my mouth shut. Amen. <laughs> Father, I just commit every person in here and I thank you that we're becoming free. Free of events. Free of people. And you've just given us freedom and, and I just right now, if anybody in here needs to forgive, we're not going to have an altar call. You, know, you don't have to do it out loud. But, Father, so if there's, I'll just take you through these five steps real quick. Father, in Jesus' name, if there's anybody in here that's walking in this, just picture the event, picture the offense in your mind. And, Father, by faith we say we're sorry for harboring this. We, we identify it as sin, and, and we say we, 
We confess it as sin. And we right now, by faith, say, I forgive them. I forgive them. They're in your hands. That doesn't mean they were right and I was wrong. That doesn't matter. We forgive them. Father, I release them from any obligations. And I release them to you. Hallelujah, Father. And it's as simple as that and it's as hard as that. And Lord, I thank you for these precious people and I thank you that we're becoming whole and holy by taking these steps and working through this stuff. In Jesus' name we pray.